Welcome. My name is Pippa Norris and I'm delighted to speak with you about populism, pandemics and sceptical trust for the early, early career network of the Political Studies Association. So what is this about? Well, there are many different ways to understand populism. And in particular, it's been common in the past to think of these as a particular party family, seen in Europe as part of the populist radical right, populist far right, populist extreme right, and so on. But do populist parties worldwide share common values, ideas, issue positions, or rhetorical discourse? And are there distinct varieties of populist parties? And what's the impact of populism on government performance, especially towards COVID-19, a case study which is of contemporary concern? And what are the broader implications for trust? So to talk about this, I'm going to rely upon a new faculty research paper that you can download called Measuring Populism Worldwide. And you can also look at this from the new article just out, preprint in Party Politics, with the same title. So this is what I'd like to do. Firstly, I'll talk about the concept, and in particular how this is distinctive to other types of studies. I'll then talk about how this is operationalised, what's the methods, what's the data. I'll talk about the findings and how we can think about the ways in which we can analyse this cross-nationally, look at some robustness tests, look at the issues of uh, how this can apply to a particular case study, the COVID-19, and how parties responded to that, and then the conclusions and next steps. First, first let's start with the concepts. There's been a proliferation of different publications, of course, research. But most of these have really thought about this as a right-wing phenomena. And they've talked about radical right parties in Europe, right-wing populism, the populist radical right, etc. As soon as we think about the parties, this, for example, is just the pattern in some of the countries in Europe and the United States. Of course, Donald Trump is clearly populist, Marine Le Pen, for the oldest party, the National Front, now the National Rally, Viktor Orban in Hungary, and so on. But as soon as we go well, we see a different pattern. And so we have, for example, in Brazil, in Turkey, in the Philippines, in Venezuela, in India, a wide variety of different presidents and prime ministers, all of whom are often seen as populist, but it's not clear what they might have in common. And as we also think about this, we can also know that there are a number of progressives on the left who can also be seen as populists. For example, Podemos in Spain and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren within the Democratic Party in America. So what is populism? In this, I'm drawing on our book, Cultural Backlash. And we argue that populism is not a distinct type of leadership, as often thought about in Latin America, for example, charismatic leadership, nor is it even a family of political parties, as often assumed in Europe. Rather, it's a discourse about governance and can be adopted by actors across the entire political spectrum. In the United Kingdom, for example, Theresa May adopted a number of different populist themes, as has Boris Johnson, as has Jeremy Corbyn, and you can see populism can therefore be a way of, of speaking and certain themes which emerge from that. So populism itself makes no other clear ideological claims about programmatic policies, about what should be done, for example, towards the economy or towards healthcare or towards um, immigration, rather, it's a rhetoric about the rightful location of governance authority in any society. By rhetoric, I mean a persuasive language. It's about words, but not necessarily about policies or deeds or actions. And the words can be authentic or they may not be genuine. And populism 
makes two core claims in the rhetoric. First, it's anti-establishment, very familiar. And so it's criticising the experts. Who are these experts? Whether they're elected politicians, whether they're political parties, opposition parties, whether they're government officials in the deep state, whether they're intellectuals, who needs scientific experts? What do they know? Whether it's the privileged, whether it's the media and the fake media, partisan judges and so on. And then the second element is if you can't trust the experts in liberal democracies, trust the people. Rightful authority is based in popular sovereignty and majority rule, the silent majority. So there are some mechanisms for the direct voice of the people through majoritarian elections, through public opinion polls, referendums and rallies. But by and large, the vox pop element is not implemented. Donald Trump doesn't try to empower the people, he speaks on behalf of. Trust me, I speak on behalf of you. Populist rhetoric is most risky when it's linked with authoritarian values. And in that, we're going right back to the 1950s. And for us, these are the three different elements. One is us, them, group security. The group is under threat. And the threat is from others. And there are existential threats to the, to the identity of that group. Secondly, conventionalism. There's a hostility to outsiders who are threatening and who are them. And the outsiders can be de depicted in many different ways. Immigrants, racial and ethnic minorities, Islamophobia, misogyny for women, foreigners and xenophobia for outsiders from the country, or it can be anti-homophobia if you look at countries like Poland and Hungary, or it can be nativism or even anti-Semitism, again, being uh, re revived in Europe. And of course, group loyalty. So if you can't uh, trust outsiders and you are under threat, then you look towards a strongman leader to protect us. And that's the er er element of the values that links to the type of regime and the ways in which governance works. So how do we start to measure this? What's the ways that we can start to classify parties according to these types of rhetoric and these values? We can identify party families by shared names. And that works for older parties, but not really for populists who have a variety of different labels in different places. We can look at international affiliations, for example, EU groups, but that doesn't work very much, again, worldwide. We can look at leadership speeches, although here there are big questions about whether uh, we can, uh, how we select those speeches, what's typical of these. We can look at party platforms, but in fact those projects don't really look at populism very much. We can try to think about roll call votes, or cross-national surveys of party elites, or surveys of the electorate. Certainly we can try and look at mass uh, opinions. But expert surveys are the method which has been used for parties. They were pioneered by Francis Castles and Peter Mayer in their study of 1984, continued by various authors and replicated particularly by the Chapel Hill expert survey Chess. So what the Global Party Survey does is replicate these methods but expand it worldwide and bring in new measures of populism. So it was an international survey and it was fielded in, uh, in December 2019, gathering responses from 1,861 party and election experts, all of them validated through my previous research, the Electoral Integrity Project. The survey covers over 1,000 parties in 163 countries, going well beyond Western democracies. It uses 21 scaled measures to estimate key values, positions, and populist rhetoric. And it basically covers each of those as 10 point scales. And then those scales can be categorized into party typologies. So we have measures uh, that could be used for the strongest polar extremes, for example, the furthest left and the furthest right. Then the data set also includes standardized party codes, so you can merge it quite easily with other electoral studies. And it also gathers some information about the experts, including their own left-right ideology, their age, their gender, and so on. And therefore, it also maintains continuity 
with previous studies. So the form of party competition, the major cleavages are those about populism, which is about legitimate authority. So we have items on that. We have items on the left-right economic values, the traditional post-war cleavage, for example, the role of state versus markets, and also items on conservative liberal cultural cleavage on the role of the state in managing social order, foreign relations and moral issues. These are the items, the 21 core items in the survey, and they include, for example, the left-right scale, immigration scales, environmental scales and populist scales. And they look like this. Each expert is asked about their own country. This is the item on economic issues on the left-right. And those parties which are populated by the eight largest parties in that country are those on the economic left, are they on the economic right, or where would you place the party on this scale? So in Britain, it would be populated by the Labour, Conservative, Lib Dems, Scottish Nationalists, and so on. And here's the key measure, measuring pluralism versus populism. And the idea is that populist language typically challenges the legitimacy of established political institutions and emphasises that the will of the people should prevail. Pluralist rejects these ideas, believes in compromise, checks and balances, and a variety of constraints. Where would you place each party? The coverage is global, 163 independent nation states, excluding microstates, those without direct elections or parties, and those where we had uh, no adequate uh, expert response. And the cleavages, again, once we define our populist parties, are the left to the right on the economic values and the liberal to the conservative on the social values. And this leads to our classification of political parties on the one hand, we have those parties who are right wing and liberal, and those, sorry, right wing and conservative, and those are the conventional radical right. And we also have those who are left wing and liberal, who are the liberal left. But as you can see, there's actually four boxes, not two. And rather than using those labels, these are the labels which are better for understanding varieties of populism. We have those who are conservative and right, who we term authoritarian conservatives, those who are progressive liberals and left, the progressive left. But we also have nativist socialists who are left-wing towards the economy, but highly conservative on social values. And we have a few free market libertarians who are liberal on issues of gender and homosexuality and a small role for the state, but also conservative in their role of the state towards the economy. How does this look when we operationalize it? Well, let's look at some findings. Is we can look at this by comparing the degree of populism in each party. And the reds are the most strongly populist. The greens are the most strongly pluralist. And I've shown you here just the OECD countries for comparisons. And we have the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, which is whether the party is to the left or the right and the vertical axis, which is whether the party is liberal or conservative. So let's look at a couple of countries to make sense of this. And you can pick any of the countries you're most familiar with, but let's pick, for example, Spain. And here what you can see is that we do have Vox, which is classically a radical right party, which is conservative in its social values and right wing towards markets and the role of the welfare state. But you can also see that you have Podemos, which is also populist in their rhetoric, but is clearly a progressive left party. And the other parties more or less fall across the, across the, um, across the spectrum. You can draw a line across each of those. Let's look at Switzerland. And you can also see here that the parties distribute themselves. So we have a number of different conservative right wing parties. Uh, very strong and, of, of course, serving in government. And we also have left-wing parties, the Workers' Party, the Socialist Party in the progressive left. And we can see 
if we look at the United States, that the Democrats are classically progressive left, of course, but more or less centrist, whereas the Republicans, the GOP, are quite a long way to the conservative right. This can also be compared not just with each other across countries, but with the median voter. We can place the median voter using the World Values Survey and then look at where the parties are just from that. And again, we get a similar pattern, for example, in Spain, standardised around where the median voter is, which is where the crosshairs are, Vox being a long way away, and Podemos uh, being closer to the median voter. So let's get rid of the boxes and countries and let's look at this then across a variety of different countries. And here what we have is the major parties, over 10% of the seats, in liberal democracies only, classified by VDEM. And what we can do is put them all together. And again, we have the same convention. In other words, left, right, across the bottom, liberal, conservative, on the vertical. And you can see that in liberal democracies, which have been around for centuries or decades, we see many countries where the parties have sort, sort, sorted themselves out. So many of the populist parties in Crimson are indeed in the conservative right-wing box. Vox, we mentioned earlier, the Swiss People's Party is another example, the Republican Party, Likud, Alternative for Germany, and so on. But you can also see that in that quadrant, you get many parties who are the traditional centre-right, Christian Democratic Union, New Zealand uh, National Party, and so on. And then you can also see the standard Social Democratic and Labour parties who are in the opposite quadrant. Uh, and there again, you've got a number of different examples in Denmark, in the Netherlands, uh, in the Czech Republic, in Israel, and so on, and the United States. But you also see that we have a scattering of some other parties that don't fit those two boxes. In particular, we see in Denmark, the interesting case of the Danish People's Party, it's actually somewhat towards the left on the economy because they favor the welfare state and they also favor uh, fairly liberal policies towards gender and towards gay rights and so on. And we can also see in the opposite that there's some libertarian parties. In the Netherlands, the People's Party for Freedom, again, has been fairly tolerant on certain issues, of homosexuality, for example, although very anti-immigrant, a mixed case, but other cases there where, again, they can be seen as uh, parties which are um, variety. There's a variety of different cases. So we have the authoritarian conservatives and the progressive left. But as soon as we go worldwide, what you immediately see is that all four quadrants are being populated. The same axis, but here what we've done is we've expanded to look at electoral democracies. These are often less established, sometimes known as third wave democracies or new, new democracies, but they're also in various different countries. And immediately you can see that some populists look at Fidesz, for example, left wing on the economy, on the role of the state, as a legacy of communism. Poland, the same, but highly socially conservative, some of the most conservative that we have. The BJP is on the other side. That's a, uh, a case that fits. They're very right-wing and nationalist in their values. But if you look at, for example, the, uh, the right-wing liberals, the libertarians, we see a number of countries there, a number of parties there. And again, we can see a lot of, a lot of parties which are in the left-wing quadrant. So we have nativ nativist socialists and we have free market libertarians. All of these, to summarise, can be seen as varieties of strongly populist parties. That is to say, they are highly populist out of the 10-point scale, but their values varies a lot. They're not all radical right by any stretch of the imagination. Now, if we look at the number of cases, it's true that out of all of the, out of all of the parties under comparisons, over 100 or 46% are the authoritarian conservatives, but there's almost as many nativist socialist parties, 42%. Uh, there are fewer progressive liberals, which is another interesting question. And there are a fewer uh, free market libertarians, but there are some. Now, 
are these findings actually robust? In other words, if we take another study, do we find that they're highly correlated? And the reliable estimates can be compared with the CHES study, with a populist expert list, and with also the mass level of the World Value Survey. And the simple conclusion from the comparisons is that yes, they are robust, despite different methods, different periods, different questions, there's a strong correlation. Is the correlation between the GPS measures and the CHES measures, again, two years difference, but nevertheless, in 84 parties, where they're the same questions. And you can see a strong correlation, for example, whether the party is liberal or conservative in their social values, uh, a correlation of R is 0.939. You hardly ever get anything higher than that. And all the others are, are strong as well. So two separate studies comes to similar estimates. Same is true if we look at it as a scatter plot. Again, there's a few who are slightly less, further, who are further away, but most of the parties are clearly across the line. And the same is true if we compare it with the populist, which is a list of parties published in The Guardian, which was in Europe, which parties people thought were most populist, and those are highlighted in red. And as we can see, the red cases are nearly all in the top right-hand corner. <coughs> in other words, the most populist, according to GPS as well. And the same is true if we also compare it with the World Value Survey, where we can look at the left-right position of voters and the left-right position of the parties. And again, it's a broader pattern, as you would expect, because voters and parties may be different for all sorts of reasons. But there is a, a correlation which is significant across those two. Now, there are therefore varieties of parties. The final section I wanted to talk about is the COVID-19 test and then the overall results. First, what's the performance of these parties when they come to power? And you can think about this in many ways. Most of the work has been done on immigration policy. There's also some work on international relations. But there are many other ways in which populists in power could have a distinctive uh, type of performance, particularly the criticism of science and of experts might lead them to be less, uh, to be slower in responding to the warnings from the COVID-19 crisis when they first started to occur. This just illustrates the overall cumulative number of cases, according to the Financial Times, who've been tracking this on a daily basis, in the United States and the European Union, and clearly the United States, where the pandemic is out of control and where it's rising rapidly, despite the fact that the European Union stabilised early and has since flattened, although there are still some cases with a broadly flat uh, uh, pattern, an enormous contrast between the performance of the governments in Europe and the government in the United States. And it's not simply the US. We can think about Brazil and Bolsonaro, who, of course, has just personally succumbed to the COVID, crisis, COVID thing, who refused to wear masks and who has uh, continued to shake hands. We can think of the cases of India. We can think of the cases with Modi. We can think of the cases of Putin and Russia. And in each case, we can see that their cumulative cases have been remarkably high compared with many other countries. Now, of course, these are some of the largest countries, so that is going to also affect this. So let's look at this more systematically. And we can think of cases like Italy, where populists have been um, received strong support, which have managed to curb the crisis. And we can also think of other cases which have been um, non, non uh, which have had pluralists in power, who have also failed to have an effective government policy. So how do we think about this? Well, to think about this systematically, what we can do is we can compare the degree of populism of the parties in government as measured by the GPS survey with their policy responses. And the policy responses are measured by the Oxford stringency index that takes 17 different items which governments have implemented to try to deal with the pandemic. These can be broken down into two different types. One is about healthcare responses, for example, how much contact tracing has been implemented and when, and lockdown policies, which are about things like school or business closure. 
Each of those can be converted into 100 point scales. And what we're doing is we're looking at whether or not the government populism is related to when they implemented responses to COVID-19, controlling for a variety of other factors. For example, GDP, because obviously rich countries have more resources than poor countries. A health security index published in 2019, which assesses the country's capacity to respond to any type of health emergency. The demographic characteristics of a country, for example, the size and the population over 65, since that makes countries more vulnerable to mortalities. The regime type, because democracies may be more accountable, but they also may be slower to respond than, for example, the case in China. The time elapsed since the country's first confirmed COVID case, because obviously the, uh, the pandemic has affected different countries at different periods. And then also global regional effects, since things like SARS may have affected Asia in a way that Europe didn't have that experience, and time fixed effects. And this is work which has been done in a paper using my data by Karim Kavalaki, and you can download that from his website. It's a draft paper, uh, not yet been published, just come out. First, what does it look like? Well, what we've got here are the two different indices, one about health measures, one about closures. We've got all of the countries which are in the comparison, and we've got those which have been governed by strongly populist parties in red, and those which are governed by any other type of government in blue. This doesn't take account of their ideology, that's, separate, that's measured separately, but just by their degree of populism, according to the measures in my survey. If you look at the health measures, what you can see visually from the line is that the parties governed by populists, Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi and Johnson, have been slower to respond throughout the month from February until they start to act to catch up in March. And remember that the COVID pandemic started in China, on, it was declared on the 31st of December. By the 1st of February, the World Health Organization said it was a pandemic and it expands exponentially, meaning that it rapidly increases once the first cases have taken hold. So that early period really required effective action on health, on testing, on supplies, on stockpiling, on building expertise, in order to really contain the, the uh, pandemic. And the countries governed by strongly populist governments were much slower to respond throughout the month of February. Essentially, very little was done, for example, in the United States, except for a ban on Chinese nationals flying into the United States, when it turned out that, in fact, the first cases in New York were from Europe. They weren't from China at all. And Trump and his administration did very little else and the task force was created, but it did not uh, initiate effective measures, nor did the states, even though the first deaths were recorded in Washington state, in New York, and uh, a few elsewhere uh, in early, uh, sorry, in mid-February. Then the populist parties scrambled, caught up, but nevertheless, by that stage, it was somewhat too late, given the nature of the pandemic. If we look at the contact, sorry, the um, closure measure, this is a different one. This is when did a country have lockdown on its, on its schools, on its businesses, and so on. Here, what you can see, again, is that the, uh, the strongly populist gov pop parties were slower than those which were governed by any other type of government, on the left or the right. Uh, and the, most parties and most governments started this work later than the healthcare they started this in March, the lockdown, but nevertheless, <coughs> the populace was slower. How much does this mean? The key findings and then the conclusions from the talk. Essentially, that we can see that the, uh, even after controlling for all the other factors, strongly populist governments lagged behind other governments in implementing policy responses. For the health measure, for example, strongly populist governments lagged between seven to 10 points on the 100 point scale in February. And on country closures, lockdowns, there was a similar size effect for populist parties and populist governments in March. 
And particularly it's interesting that in the most affluent countries, high income countries, which should have been the best place to respond and to deal with this, they were especially slow in implementing health measures. The extent of their health measures were on average 15 points lower in January and almost 30 points lower in February amongst those countries which were governed by strongly populist parties. A substantial difference. So Trump, Bolsonaro and Johnson were not isolated cases. They were in fact typical of a broader pattern. The mistrust of experts, <coughs> which is part of populism, and the mistrust of science, the proclivities towards um, magical thinking, uh, and the mistrust of the state and state intervention <coughs> have all been part of this delay. So, the conclusions. Obviously, deadly consequences for COVID. The cases in the United States continue to accelerate and 40 states have seen growing cases. It's not a second wave, it's the first wave, but the Sun Belt in particular is running out of hospital capacity. The consequences have been immense and they show no signs of slowing. Meanwhile, the President Trump is taking no responsibility and there's no federal coordination as the pandemic runs roughshod through the country. The broader uh, implications. The patterns of party competition are complex and multidimensional, that they're not simple, that they're not going to be based on one radical right category. There are many populist parties around the world, many are socially conservative, but party competition is multidimensional and there are varieties of populist parties. The impact on policy, the COVID case study is interesting, but we need to look more broadly, for example, at environmental policy, at international relations, at a wide range of policies that governments are responsible for. And we're only starting to unpack that. And the implications are that maybe we should be sceptical about trust in populist parties and leaders. The assumption has always been, in much of the literature, that trust in government is a good thing, trust in the authorities will lead to compliance, but not, of course, if the information is misinformation, if people are being told to drink bleach, or they're being told that masks don't matter, or that social distancing isn't important. So trust has two faces, and that's the topic of my current book, uh, In Praise of Skepticism, that will be developing for Oxford University Press. Any different further things you can do. If you want to take this data, by all means play with it. You can look at, for example, the macro level characteristics of populism. What's the pattern, for example, across different types of regimes? What are the consequences for backsliding? And you can use it also for voting behaviour and elections by understanding how parties compare with the median voter and compare the popular legitimacy of authoritarian regimes. The new paper, again, Measuring pop Populism Worldwide, is just out preprint in party politics. And you can get a link and more details at the globalpartysurvey.org, including more graphs and more features and so on. And you can also get the data by going to this, the Dataverse, and downloading it at any level that you like, at expert level, or at the level of country, or at the level of party. And your, uh, th this was carried out in December 2019, so it's a pre-COVID um, study. But I'm going to do it again, probably in December 2020, so I have a pre and post expert survey to see how parties respond to the economic uh, and, and healthcare crisis that so many have gone through. There's much more can be done. There's many supplementary materials which can be available and you can download this PowerPoint with all of these different graphs and you can uh, look at it on the website. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that you all have a very good conference and uh, uh, I hope that this has been useful for how we understand populism and the current health crisis that we're all living, for, living through. Thank you very much.